Hi there and welcome to the Explaining History podcast again and today we're looking at conditions on the Russian front. If you go back far enough uh, in the podcast, it took quite a long way now, uh, probably two, a couple of years, we looked at the, the first kind of phase of Operation Barbarossa from June to December uh, and now we're looking at the uh, the really dreadful uh, experience of Russia in 1942. So as we have done in the past we're looking again at um, All Hell Let Loose by Max Hastings which is you know a gemly good reader on the Second World War. If you if you want a kind of um, uh, an overview armchair book there's uh, it's, it's a pretty good read. The ultimate of course is Anthony Beaver's um, Second World War which is uh, really, really something else. It's an absolutely fantastic book, um, and looks at the Second World War in just a kind of a, a, a an amazing kind of thematic way. We'll uh, we'll dive into that one as well at some point. Anyway, Max Hastings writes a phenomenon created by the strong emotions and fantastical uh, experiences war brought upon Russia was a resurgence of religious worship with Stalin, which Stalin did uh, not seek to suppress. At Easter 1942, Moscow's overnight curfew was lifted, and Dr. Sofia Shkupina uh, attended the Great Orthodox Cathedral in Moscow's um, Elkovskaya uh, Square. We arrived at 8pm, and there was a small queue to bless the kurich, uh, the Easter bread, and eggs. An hour later, there was, a queue, uh, there was such a crowd, one couldn't turn, uh, and no air to breathe. Amid the throng, women screamed, They've crushed me, I'm going to faint. The atmosphere grew, grew so, so humid that moisture ran down the columns. Candles passed from one person to, um, uh, to another, um, uh, from one person to another, sent smoke curling into spirals. There were many young people. I don't know why they had come there. Some mums came with their kids and a lot of military men. There were people even sitting on the cross with the picture of Christ. It was like a football crowd. At 11 p.m., a priest appeared and announced that our friends, the British, are about to arrive. We could no longer breathe and went outside where we saw several cars drive up. It was the British Embassy delegation. Army nurse um, Evdokia uh, Kalininchenko, uh, wrote, Kalininchen- Kalininchenko wrote in May, We're having a little break for the first time this month. We've made the wounded men comfortable, dried ourselves out, uh, and had a wash in the real in a real banya in the bathhouse. We've been on so many roads, all kinds of roads, mostly country roads, often mud bound, rutted, and degraded by rain holes, bumps. One's heart breaks when the vehicle jolts. Most of the passengers are gravely wounded, and for some, such jolt and jolting can be fatal. Now, however, it is so quiet around us that it is hard to believe that there is any war anywhere on the planet. We wander about in the woods and gather bunches of flowers. The sun shines, the sky is blue. We keep peering upwards for, by force of habit, but see only passing clouds. We think that the Germans have, le- have at last been stopped and won't try to go any further. They've learned their mess- lesson on the approaches to Moscow. So those two little vignettes are really interesting and they they show that kind of even during the madness of war, these moments of everyday life intrude. There was a great comment I remember uh, many years ago watching The World at War in the final episode. I think it was somebody who had been uh, with the, the British Army in the desert said that the war was um, tiny, brief moments of terror punctuated by long periods of boredom. And the the experience of people in wartime would you know inevitably included moments of the mundane moments of the everyday moments of of kind of uh, the experience of 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 social life however during this period of time the the impact on russia is is really really uh, critical none of the the british who are uh, russia's only surviving ally um are convinced russia will fall that there is there's no hope um, and that um, the, before America enters the war um, at the 
end of 1941 that there's little chance of of uh, Russia surviving. Kalinichenko hoped too much too soon, writes Max Hastings. Though the Russians had a mass and could rep, uh, replace their horrific 1941 losses, they still lacked the combat power and logistical support to sustain deep penetrations. The New Year offensive by five fronts of army groups, personally directed by Stalin, petered out even before the spring thaw arrested movement. The Germans held their line south of Leningrad, maintaining the threat to the city. They moved to cut off the Volkov front and destroyed the second shock army. Its commander, uh, Lieutenant General uh, Andrei Vlazov, was captured and subsequently raised the Cossack Russian Liberation Army for the Nazis. In the Crimea, the Germans blocked the western exit from the Kerch Peninsula, trapping the v- a vast Russian army, and then counterattacked. Between the 8th and the 19th of May, Manstein um, achieved another triumph, shattering the Crimean front and taking 170,000 prisoners. 7,000 survivors took refuge in limestone caves until the Germans blasted the entrances of the explosives and pumped in gas. Lieutenant General Gunter Blumentritt, who became a Wehrmacht army commander, wrote of the Russians rather as he might have described wild beasts he had come not to respect but grudgingly feared. Eastern man is very different from his western counterpart. He has a much greater capacity for enduring hardship, and this passivity induces a high degree of equanimity towards life and death. Eastern man does not possess much initiative. He is accustomed to taking orders, to being led. The Russians attach little importance to what they eat or wear. It is surprising how long they can survive on what to a western man would be a starvation diet. Close contact with nature enables these people to move freely by night or in fog, through woods and across swamps. They are not afraid of the dark, nor of their endless forests, nor of the cold. The Siberian, who is is partially or completely Asiatic, note the kind of uh, fascist racial language there, is even tougher. The psychological effect of the country on the ordinary German soldier was considerable. He felt small and lost in the endless space. A man who had survived the Russian enemy and the Russian climate has little more to learn about war. Manstein favoured bypassing the fortress at Sevastopol, but Hitler insisted on its capture. Now this would be a theme throughout um, the experience of the um, of Barbarossa, that um, the well in t- the well thought through strategies of people like Manstein, who let's face it, came up with the with the sickle cut that um, left the British Expeditionary Force stranded at Dunkirk. Um, were be kind of overruled by Hitler. Uh, Richard J. Evans writes uh, very um, kind of de- in a very detailed fashion um, about Hitler's micromanagement um, on the Eastern Front. The old principle that the German general staff once applied to um, field generals and commanders of Auftrag's tactic of uh, looking at and obeying broad strategic direction, but improvising on the ground, uh, is gradually eroded by Hitler. And this had been a uh, a hugely uh, important strategy, strategy and tactic um, for uh, Germany since uh, uh, through, since the mid nineteenth century, since the wars of unification. Hitler was unable to um, permit that. He viewed himself to be the supreme strategic brain. Um, the, there were uh, numerous German generals who would beg to differ. Who said, you know, Hitler he did understand quite a lot about warfare, having been a soldier, but understood very little about how armies move around. Um, and this this gradual erosion of gem, uh, of the autonomy of the general staff is huge damage to Germany's ability to wage war in the end. The thirteen thousand uh, the one thousand three hundred and fifty ton eighty eight mm eight hundred millimeter giant siege gun Big Dora was brought forward. 
utilizing enormous labor because it could only uh, move on twin, twin railway tracks. Franz Halder dismissed Dora, an example of wasteful Nazi industrial effort on prestige weapons, as an extremely impressive piece of engineering, but quite useless. Its seven-ton shells and 4,000-strong crew contributed much less to the capture of the city than the dogged efforts of Manstein's infantry. The defenders were also pounded from the air. A Luftwaffe dive bomber, a pilot, Captain Herbert Parber, uh, wrote, One explosion next to another, like poisonous mushrooms, shot up between the rocky hideouts. The whole peninsula was fire and smoke, yet in between the thousands of prisoners, uh, in, in the end, thousands of prisoners were taken even there. One can only stand amazed at such resilience. That is how they defended Sevastopol, all along the line. The whole country had to be literally ploughed over with bombs before they yielded a short distance. Here we can see a subtle and yet crucial transition in racial thinking about Slavic people by uh, the, uh, the, the Nazi regime. Previously, uh, before Barbarossa had begun, the uh, prevailing idea was that the, um, the, the the Russian people would be a, a walkover, that they were um, that they were a combination of uh, these sort of Asiatics, which is this kind of racial language for anybody who comes from you know, east of the uh, the Bug River. Um, the 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 they were kind of um uh, sort of, sort of savages, uh, and that sort of Judeo Bolshevism, this kind of Marxist Marxist control of of Russia, um, which is obviously some kind of cruel Jewish trick in the eyes of the Nazis, had led to a kind of a a, a sort of a, a, a rotting of um of of what kind of culture and civilization. It existed there um, when Hitler looked at the um, the Finnish uh, the Russo Finnish War um, in the winter of 1939-40. He said, "Look, you know, the door is ready to be kicked in." Um, uh, he, he basically that was what convinced him um, that the time for Barbarossa was was nigh. However, after kind of six to eight months of campaigning in Russia. Uh, many Germans began to. They didn't stop having racial ideas about the uh, the Slavs, but instead they started to think, well, this these these kinds of uncivilized barbarians are incredibly hardy and tough. They are, you know, in some ways, you know, culturally and socially inferior to us. My goodness, they are fighters, um, and they stopped seeing them uh, as a, a pushover and weak. And they, it become, became very clear to German commanders that the war in Russia would be a long one. And here is the worry in the heart of uh, every Wehrmacht general, is that long wars can't be won. You have to conquer quickly because of the pressure on, on resources. When the city finally, this is Sevastopol, when the city finally fell on the 4th of July, after a siege of 250 days, the NKVD's units were among those which escaped, after massacring all the prisoners. So the NKVD, uh, the Soviet secret police, would have killed all the prisoners to prevent the possibility of any collaboration. Um, and the, there was an assumption that, particularly because lots of them would have been political prisoners, enemies of the state, that these are the sorts of people who would uh, see the Nazis as uh, liberators and march at the head of Nazi columns into Russia. So you, you, you shoot those guys first. The dreadful losses in the Crimea were attributed to the incompetence of the Soviet commander, a Stalin's favourite, Lev Meklis, who rejected pleas for his units to be allowed to dig in as a symptom of defeatism. The only redeeming feature of the disaster was that Meklis was sacked. Sevastopol cost the Germans 25,000 dead and 50,000 tons of artillery and ammunition. The attackers were again impressed by the stubbornness of the resistance. So th this idea of you know not digging in in order to prevent the accusation of defeatism, well, the the 
the kind of effect of the purge of the purges on particularly on the military had this kind of cumulative effect on on the army firstly nobody wanted to be seen as a decision maker decision makers tended uh, in the past historically to have been taken up and shot they were um, uh, military men with minds of their own very dangerous as far as Stalin was concerned then when Barbarossa happens and Barbarossa is massively exacerbated by the fact that all this this kind of the infrastructure of leadership has been completely ripped apart then um, we you know stand and fight isms are a kind of a massive imperative as far as Stalin is concerned. Any sign of defeatism, in a way, is really a kind of a, 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 an indication that, um, or any kind of defeatism among Russian soldiers is normally the product of, of, of a sense of hopelessness that has been engendered and created almost by um, Stalin's military incompetence and his um, uh, and, and the, the effects of his purges. So it becomes in, imperative to demonstrate to Stalin that you are not being defeatist and therefore not kind of casting shade in, in, in his direction. So hence this kind of ridiculous performative nonsense of uh, Russians, Russian generals um, basically kind of ignoring basic military practice in order to show that they have faith in the supreme leader, in the Vojd. Meanwhile, further north, as the um, ground ride out after the thaw, on the 12th of May, General Semyon Timoshenko launched a thrust by um, uh, uh, by southwestern front um, um, towards Kharkov, which failed disastrously. Yet again, a German counterattack encircled the Russians, and yet again, Stalin refused to permit retreat, causing a lot more, um, uh, causing a loss of more than a quarter of a million men. The army commander and some of his officers shot themselves rather than accept capt- captivity. The survivors were driven eastwards in rout. One man said, "We wept as we retreated. We were running anywhere to get away from Kharkov. Some to Stalingrad, others to." Father um, who? Uh, where else would we end up? Turkey? Hitler's confidence revived. He dismissed Germany's losses in the previous year's fighting and accepted the view of Colonel Reinhard Gechlin, the Eastern Front Intelligence Chief, um, that, that Stalin's reserves were exhausted. By August, German weapons output would, again, would regain full momentum following a disastrous July 1941 decision, rescinded only in January 1942, to cut arms and ammunition production in anticipation of victory. It was extraordinary that Hitler retained the loyalty and obedience of his officers after the strategic madnesses of the previous campaign and the privations of winter. In late Crimea in January 1942, in the Crimea in January 1942, an embittered German soldier itemised his diet. One hot meal a day, cabbage soup with potatoes in it, half a loaf of bread every second day, some fat, a little cheese and hard honey. Yet even on such fare, the Wehrmacht remained a formidable fighting force. Most of, his, most of Germany's generals, in the dark recesses of their souls, knew that they had made their nation and its entire army. Um, it was a myth that the, only the SS committed atrocities, complicit in crimes against humanity, and especially uh, Russian humanity, such as their enemies would never forgive, even before the Holocaust began. They saw nothing to lose by fighting on, except more millions of lives, it deserves emphasis that a large majority of the war's victims perished from 1942 onwards. Only victories might induce the Allies to make terms. Hitler's, Hitler's April directive for the summer operations called for a concentration of effort in the South. The objectives of Operation Blue were to destroy the Red Army's residual reserves, seize Stalingrad and capture the Caucasian oil fields. And this is going to be the next direction we take in looking at Barbarossa. It was, is the, uh, it is essentially Operation Blue. It is what happens when Hitler mar- marches southwards and splits his armies between the oil, fi- the oil fields of the Caucasus and then sends a small splinter, really, of the 6th Army to, uh, of, of Army Group South, which is the 6th the Army, to lay siege to Stalingrad. Stalingrad might have turned out an awful lot differently had Hitler committed adequate forces to it. Max Hastings writes, Stalin misjudged German intentions 
Anticipating a new thrust against Moscow, he concentrated his forces accordingly. Even when the entire blue plan was laid before him, after being found on the body of a Wehrmacht staff officer killed in an air crash, he dismissed it as disinformation. But Russia's armies remained much stronger than Hitler had realised, with 5.5 million men under arms and rapidly increasing tank and aircraft production. Criminals and some political prisoners were released from the Gulag's um, labour camps for service, 975,000 of them by the war's end. Berlin estimated Russia's 1942 steel output at 8 million tonnes. In reality, it would attain 13.5 million tonnes. The first phase of Blue, expected to take three weeks, began on the 28th of June with an assault towards the Don. Against Stalin's armies, Hitler deployed 3.5 million Germans, but a further million Axis troops. Italians, Romanians, the Spanish Blue Division dispatched by Franco as a goodwill gesture, with spectacular initial success. When Pravda correspondent Lazar Brontman um, arrived in Voronezh, 300 miles northwest of Stalingrad, I f at first he found the city relaxed and secure in its remoteness from the enemy. He was amused at w uh, one evening by the droll spectacle of scores of women in the park dancing with each other in the absence of male partners. Women also police the city. Brontman observed that they, um, that they directed traffic more efficiently than men, but used their whistles too much. Within days, however, the mood darkened dramatically. Further west, the Russian line broke, precipitating yet another headlong retreat. German bombers began to pound Voronezh's streets, ironing the city without meeting resistance, and prompting a great exodus of refugees. Profiteers who owned vehicles charged desperate people three, four, five thousand rubles for the privilege of a ride eastwards. One by one, the city's factories and government offices shut down. When its inhabitants learned that the Germans were only 30 miles away, Bronman wrote that Voronezh was psychologically prepared for surrender. And indeed, the city was overrun a few days later. The advancing panzers were delayed by rain and mud more than the Red Army, and in early June, re um, and in early June reached their initial objectives. Stalin mandated the only authorised Russian strategic retreat of the war, when the Germans continued their advance east beyond Voronezh, they found themselves attacking empty space. Russian forces escaped from an intended envelopment at Milerovo, um, at Milerovo um, uh, prompting Hitler to sack um, Bock for the second time, then splitting his army group south into two new commands, A and B, commanded respectively by List and Vikes. But the Fuhrer exalted uh, in, the prog um, in the progress of the campaign, which thus far had been a mere armoured victory ride. His infantry was scarcely called upon to fight and losses were negligible. New swathes of Soviet territory fell into German hands. Um, through, the, through July, the panzers swept southwards to Rostov, savagely mauling the Russian um, south front as its formation sought escape from the Don. Hitler commissioned Friedrich Paulus, a staff officer eager to prove himself as a field commander, to lead the 6th Army in a dash for Stalingrad. Most of Germany's generals immediately recognised the folly of this move. The strategic significance of Stalin's name city was, uh, was small, irrelevant to the main objective of clearing the Caucasus and securing its oil. Moreover, Hitler's eagerness for symbolic triumph was uh, matched by the determination of Stalin to deny this to him. If Stalingrad fell, the Soviet leader uh, feared a, new, uh, um, a, new uh, a new renewed German thrust in the north against Moscow. Of course, um, Stalingrad sits on the Volga and would be able to cut mo uh, Moscow off from fuel supplies. He thus determined that Vol the Volga city must be held at all costs and committed um, to its defence three armies from his strategic reserve. The stage was set for one of the decisive battles of the war, a collision between the personal will of the two dictators. So there we, we, we leave things, but the, the kind of the context of Stalingrad's a fascinating one. Um, and the fact that Hitler was unable, uh, or his generals were unable to make themselves heard, um, and Hitler's personal uh, beliefs about um, the his successes. Hitler was really drunk on his own success and believed his his own myth, and had gone from being quite a cautious uh, figure in the 1930s, a cautious dictator, to uh, an inveterate gambler, and 
by the spring and summer of 1942 believed he couldn't lose. And so Stalingrad, if, if one had been in Voronezh in the summer of 1942, one might easily have assumed Stalingrad would fall next. But it doesn't. And the story of Stalingrad is, on in this narrative, what we're going to look at next. So thanks for listening, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Take good care. All the best. Bye-bye.